So, I'm David Luke, and uh, I'm a psychologist at the uh, University of Greenwich uh, in the UK, in London. Uh, you can see it there. Um, like all good psychologists, you know, 20 years ago or so, I was a little bit messed up, and uh, I wanted to know why. So, I went away and studied psychology, of course, and here I am several years later, and, uh, well, I'm still messed up, uh, <laughs> but at least I know why, so that's a good thing. Um, so I teach a course there on the psychology of exceptional human experience, um, which is, uh, covers psychedelic experience, transpersonal psychology, and all manner of uh, interesting experiences, mystical experiences. And uh, I also conduct research on, on psychedelics as well. Uh, I should be careful how I say that. Um, but in terms of self-experimentation, I mean, I conduct research on psychedelics, if you know what I mean. Um, one of the things we do is a uh, conference as well. It's called Breaking Convention. Um, the next one is uh, in July. Um, it's been going now, it's in its third one. Uh, we do it every two years. Uh, the first one was at the University of Kent. Uh, we had about four or 500 people uh, coming along to that. Uh, that was an excellent success. We didn't know how many people would come, but it was extremely popular. Uh, two years ago, we did a, an even bigger one at the University of Greenwich. We had about 700 people come. Um, and this is, indicates the increase in interest in, in this kind of research. And uh, hopefully next month, uh, it's going to be something a little bit like that. Um, although hopefully more people will come. Um, okay, so uh, just to kind of bring everyone up to the same place, I, I will just give a more of a general talk about psychedelics and then talk more about mental health. Um, and so I'll just give a brief definition of what they are. Um, I can see that. Which is a quite a dry definition, but nevertheless quite useful. So psychedelic substances are those which, without causing physical addiction, although I think some of them may, may do, but mostly they don't, uh, craving major physiological disturbances, delirium, disorientation, or amnesia, although some of them do induce a bit of amnesia, um, more or less reliably produce thought, mood, and perceptual changes, otherwise rarely experienced, except in dreams, contemplative and religious exaltation, flashes of vivid involuntary memory, and acute psychosis, although uh, the last bit is also controversial. Um, so there's uh, a lot of psychedelic substances that we know of, and they fall typically into two main classes of uh, classic psychedelics. Um, so we have the tryptamines, which are structurally similar to serotonin, and these include uh, classic hallucinogens or psychedelics like LSD, psilocybin, and DMT. And then we have uh, phenethylamines, which are more structurally similar to dopamine, which is also a naturally occurring neurotransmitter. And uh, they include things like mescaline, MDMA, and 2CB. So they're the main ones, but then we also have a, a lot of other kind of anomalies which don't fit easily into those classifications. Um, diterpenoids, uh, anticholinergics, cholinergics, muscarinergics, uh, glutamate antagonists, etc. Um, so there's a lot of variety. Uh, just to prove I'm right, I'll just show you some chemical structures. Uh, so uh, we have uh, the classic hallucinogens uh, DMT, psilocin, psilocybin, 5-methoxy DMT, and you'll see they're all very structurally similar to uh, serotonin here. Um, as is LSD, it has the same basic structure but it's more complex. And then men mescaline is a little bit of a, an anomaly, uh, and that's because it's more closely related to the structure of uh, dopamine. And there's tryptamine, the actual kind of fundamental building block. So that's the neurochemistry over. Um, we'll move on. I was trying to find out how many psychedelic substances there actually are. So I did some research and asked some uh, people who may know better than I, and uh, we kind of used... Uh, Alexander Shulgin's famous formula that uh, psychedelics have been increasing in number by a factor of 10 every 50 years. So in 1900, we had approximately two known psychedelics. 
that isn't strictly true, but we had uh, nitrous oxide and we had mescaline. Then by 1950, we had uh, that, that figure had increased to 20. By the year 2000, we had uh, 200 psychedelics of which we knew. And so we're pretty much on course for 2050 for 2,000 psychedelics. And in the year 2100, probably 20,000 psychedelics, okay? And just, I just checked to see if those figures are still accurate. And uh, about, 90, uh, about 2010, there was something like 350, 400 psychedelic substances we know of. So this is gonna be an ever-increasing area of research. Those are the ones we know of and they've been tested but there's probably about 2,000 substances we have currently which haven't been thoroughly tested yet, so plenty of work to do. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the, what we know about the, uh, what happens in the brain with psychedelics. I was involved with some research at Imperial College in London with Robin Carhart-Harris, and uh, we did some, he did some fMRI studies. Um, which got a lot of good media attention and uh, they were looking to find uses and potential treatments for depression by understanding what's going on in the brain. Uh, I took part in that research um, as a participant and uh, went inside this uh, MEG scanner just to show you how seriously I take the research. So there's me inside the uh, MEG just about to be injected with psilocybin which was a uh, Quite intense. Uh, so MEG is uh, a little bit, bit like an EEG, you know, so looking at electrical activity across the surface of the head. MEG is a bit more sophisticated and it has uh, numerous channels and you can see what's going on in the, the deeper structures of the brain. Um, so MEG stands for magnetoencephalography, um, not to be confused with uh, magneto uh, from the X-Men. Obviously, because, uh, well, he doesn't like uh, having it done to him, obviously, hence the helmet. Um, so whilst I was in the brain scanner, I had to kind of give a, a running report of our state of consciousness and uh, somewhere on a scale of zero to 100, uh, to 10, sorry, and uh, I think I was about seven there. And just to prove that I did survive, that's me afterwards. Oh, what's going on? Now, so... That research was quite interesting in that if you asked any neuroscientist uh, worth their brain imaging budget uh, what would happen in the brain if someone takes a psychedelic, they will probably say, well, there's going to be more activity. There's going to be an increase of brain activity somewhere, you know, and they all have their idea about where. Um, but nobody really predicted that there would be a decrease in activity. So this was uh, quite a massive surprise. Um, there was actually no area of the brain had an increase and a very key region called the uh, default mode network actually had reductions and according to Robin this is the, the area of the brain which was responsible for our sense of identity and ego and so when activity in that is reduced you have uh, this kind of overwhelming uh, experience of, uh, of your own consciousness I suppose. Um, just to prove that it is related, they found as activity in that region of the brain decreases, the subjective experience increases across participants. Um, so according to Robin, he said, these results strongly imply that the subjective effects of psychedelics are caused by decreased activity and connectivity in the brain's key connector hubs, enabling a state of unconstrained cognition. Well, the bit about connectivity isn't entirely true because they, they reanalyzed their data. This was looking at psilocybin and uh, comparing it to a kind of controlled placebo condition. Now, these uh, images here are kind of uh, represent the amount of interconnectivity between different regions of the brain. So, under the influence of the placebo, uh, we have you know, a small amount of connectivity going on. And then with the, uh, the psilocybin, there's a, a much greater interconnectivity going on, which seems a little bit paradoxical. So there's reduced activity, but there's increased connectivity. Um, so I was trying to kind of, how do you conceptualize that? I was thinking maybe like rush hour traffic in Prague. Um, maybe everybody's, there's a lot of traffic, but they're all just going the same way. And the 
traffic isn't moving very much. So if you take most of those people and you send them home, and then you take the rest of them and you say, okay, just drive around the rest of the Czech Republic, so you've got much more connectivity, but less activity. Does that make sense? That's one way of thinking about it. Um, you'll be pleased to know that's the end of the neuroscience. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be talking about the psychology involved. Um, so what are the psychological effects of psychedelics? This is kind of a long quote. I'm not sure I'll, I'll, I'll give it all to you. Psychedelic, psychedelics affect all of our mental functions, perception, emotion, thinking, body awareness, and our sense of self. And uh, actually a really nice definition, but I'm not going to give you the whole thing. You're probably quite familiar with the effects. Um, but overall, you can say psychedelics affect every aspect of our consciousness. Now, one way of conceptualizing psychedelics is, as well is it's not just a substance, okay? The actual experience that you have is a combination of at least three things, and that is the substance, the set, and the setting, as you're probably all familiar with. The set being your psychological framework you bring to the experience, uh, the setting being the environment in which you take it, and the substance, obviously, is the drug. Um, and Timothy Leary kind of was the first to kind of really point to this. This is the, the one uncontroversial thing he did uh, before departing from Harvard University. Uh, he came up with the idea of set, setting, and substance. Um, and there was some interesting research at that time, for instance. They found that if you handcuff somebody to a bed and lock them in a room uh, on their first LSD trip, uh, they tend to have a bad experience, okay? <laughs> Breakthrough science, this. Um, it's easy in retrospect, isn't it? Uh, and of course, then they found, well, if you put people in a, in a nice room with nice people and nice music in a nice environment, they have a nice experience. Uh, so set and setting are, are really quite crucial. Um, uh, there's uh, Tim in his own set and setting. Um, okay, so I think before we can think about these substances as potential treatments for mental health conditions. Like any uh, treatment, we have to weigh up the, the risks and the benefits. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the risks first of all, and then we'll talk about the potential benefits. So uh, obviously you hear that people can have difficult psychological experiences, i.e. bad trips. Um, there is some ongoing research being done with psilocybin currently, but this is based on a, an online internet survey of users. Uh, so we don't really know the kind of how representative this is, but from that one survey, uh, more than half of the people in, who responded have never had a bad trip. Okay, so they never had a difficult experience, and about somewhere about 80% of them had fewer than 10% of their experiences were bad. And then you get a little band of people um, who always have bad trips, so, so they should probably stay away from them. Uh, I didn't expect that. Um, and there's just some figures to demonstrate that. So I was trying to work out, well, what's the likelihood of you taking a psychedelic for the first time of you having a, a bad trip? It might be somewhere around about 5%, let's say. But bad experiences aren't necessarily, well, difficult psychological experiences aren't necessarily bad, you know, it uh, could be that people have gained some kind of insight or have some kind of breakthrough experience or they can benefit from that experience somehow and it may not be for the whole of their experience either, you know, it could be during an eight hour uh, LSD experience you may find that some of it is psychologically challenging. Um, but those uh, psychological difficulties can be reduced by set and setting of course. Um, one thing that is clear though, if people were having really difficult psychological experiences and it was, you know, traumatizing them, we'd see them turning up in uh, emergency wards of hospitals a lot more than we do. And given that in the States, 13.5% uh, of people have tried psychedelics, that's about 50 million people, uh, we don't see millions of people turning up in emergency wards, okay? Um, actually account for less than 0.05% of uh, emergency room admissions. Um, so the numbers aren't there. Uh, whether or not 
then psychedelics can trigger psychosis. That's an interesting question. Uh, back in the 60s, there was some probably somewhat bad propaganda going around that if you take LSD three times, you are clinically insane by definition. Uh, that isn't necessarily true. Um, some excellent survey research just come out um, from Krebs and Johansson, and they looked at a national survey in the US, massive samples, 130,000 people in one, 135,000 in the other, and they both came, that came up with the same results. And that is people who reported using psychedelics um, actually had lower uh, mental health concerns than people who hadn't, okay? Um, so there's a kind of breakdown of the analysis of that. Uh, so that's the kind of, the dotted line is the baseline. And we see, for instance, uh, certainly suicidal thoughts are, are reduced, although not quite significantly. The one that is significant is the number of inpatient admissions for mental health treatment. So people who have had psychedelics aren't more likely, uh, are less likely, in fact, to need mental health uh, inpatient care, which is quite interesting. So there's no epidemic of people who've taken psychedelics going mad, as a technical term. Um, what we also find is that rates of suicide aren't particularly increased. So research from uh, the clinical use of psychedelics found that suicide rates were about 0.04%, which is actually lower than the uh, psychiatric inpatient suicide rates. Um, so we can say, in terms of psychosis and suicide, the risks are very low. Uh, physiological risks, okay, so the classic psychedelics we know are, are typically very safe physiologically, things like LSD and psilocybin. Uh, I don't think there's any known cases of an overdose, for instance. Nobody's died from an overdose. People have had overdoses, but they haven't died from it. Uh, there's certainly cases where people have taken in excess of 10,000 doses, uh, people like smuggling grams of uh, LSD crystal, ingested it, 10,000 hits, and lived to tell the tale. <laughs> wow, I mean, wow, that must be an experience. Um, dependency, don't seem to have very high dependency risk. Um, Typically not addictive, although I would say things like ketamine do have uh, more potential for uh, addiction. Um, and the other one is the uh, hallucinogen persistent perception disorder, otherwise known as flashbacks. And there are some risks of that, but it is relatively rare and usually not too troubling. Um, again, there's some survey data on that and somewhere under 1% of people in that survey reported uh, flashbacks, although very few of them actually saw any kind of uh, treatment. Oh no, sorry, of those who are reporting flashbacks, 1% sought treatment, so not very many. Um, and about 4% of people trying them had, had a flashback experience. So there is a kind of a small risk of flashbacks. I've actually got um, Somebody contacted me, I do research on synesthesia and, and uh, psychedelics, and uh, he's had synesthesia for the last five years after a, a 2CB experience. Synesthesia is, uh, so you might not know what it is, so it's a mixing of your sensory experience. So uh, you may see sounds or taste colors or that kind of thing. So he has that experience. But uh, I only knew of two cases uh, uh, in the whole literature where this has occurred. So it may change your uh, perceptual experiences. Okay, so there are all the risks, and now we talk about the potential benefits. Um, so psychedelic psychotherapy and psycholytic psychotherapy have been around since the 1950s. Psycholytic psychotherapy started in the UK in 1952, um, using lower doses uh, in group psychedelic uh, group psychotherapy uh, with repeated sessions, whereas uh, psychedelic psychotherapy tended to use much higher doses, typically maybe only one or two sessions and just one person at a time. Um, the, okay, so the uses of it were then it typically induces a sense of disinhibition, um, which is good if the therapist is wanting to kind of connect with the person and 
get to their core issues, it loosens up the ego, um, importantly gives access to the material which is in the unconscious, so uh, or the repressed memories or uh, traumas or whatever it is the therapist is, is trying to get to. And uh, these can be worked out in real time. You're not, you're not having to rely on unconscious material from dreams, for instance. Um, typically, though, the, the therapy is non-directive. The therapist doesn't get too involved. The person's allowed to have the experience, um, supporting and emerging the experience, uh, alternate between inner work and outer, but typically the focus is internal. And the person's allowed to fully experience what's coming up and uh, express anything they want to. Um, obviously, set and setting is very important. Never handcuff them to the bed. That's good advice. Uh, there's always usually some preparation for the sessions. And there may be also combine it with the use of breath work, um, therapeutic touch, i.e. kind of massage or body work, and of course music. And typically, uh, sometimes also eye shades. And then, importantly as well, there's a kind of follow-up sessions and integration where the person is encouraged to talk about their experiences, write it down, uh, create artwork, and maybe kind of help them process uh, the experience itself. Um, oh, it's still in there. Uh, at one point, even, you know, the rogue, uh, well, less rogue than Leary, uh, psychiatrist, David R.D. Lang suggested that if you want to become a psychoanalyst, you had to read Freud, uh, take personal analysis, and also take LSD. And he said that was the kind of the royal road to being a psychoanalyst. Um, and uh, that's uh, Powick Hospital in the UK, 1952, where Ronald Sanderson started psycholytic psychotherapy. Um, so one of the things, one of the early ways in which the treatment was uh, developed was in helping to treat alcoholism, alcohol addiction. And it was noticed that when people withdraw from alcohol use, if they're very heavy users, they may get uh, the delirium tremens, which can be the DTs. It's kind of shakes and this. Um, it can be quite a dangerous experience, but often people will stop drinking from that point if they have the DTs. It's kind of quite a terrifying experience and allows them to kind of have some kind of insight into what they're doing, as does uh, a psychedelic experience. Um, and a lot of that early work was in treating alcoholics. Um, a recent meta-analysis of, of the, the, the studies that were published found that actually, yes, psychedelics were um, useful in the treatment of alcoholism relative to other programs. Um, there's some papers there. Uh, other substances have also been used other than LSD. Uh, have particularly the use of ketamine was researched fairly widely in Russia. And then um, things like iboga and ayahuasca as well have also been used uh, as uh, addiction treatments, which is uh, quite controversial in a way, but you know, you're fighting fire with fire. So you're treating drug addictions with drugs, but uh, non-addictive drugs. Um, so a whole number of other studies have, have been conducted in recent years. There really is a renaissance of research in psychedelics going on. Uh, some successful pilot work looking at psilocybin in the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, uh, a lot of research going into looking at MDMA, i.e. ecstasy. Um, for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder and also psilocybin and LSD in the treatment of end-of-life uh, anxiety. Uh, people who have terminal cancer. Now, it doesn't treat the cancer, but it does help the people deal with the anxiety produced uh, as they near death. And typically what happens is the people are less depressed and they also need less medication after the uh, psychedelic therapy session and they're in less pain. Uh, so primarily the psychedelics have been used for treatment of uh, difficult psychogenic uh, disorders or problems, primarily depression, anxiety, trauma, and addiction. So these are some of the studies that are, are currently underway. Uh, some of these results are coming in now. Uh, MDMA particularly for post-traumatic stress disorder, 
in various countries. Um, but the conference we're doing next month, this is another plug, uh, somebody will be reporting on their use of uh, MDMA for treating autism. And uh, another good study at John Hopkins University in the US where they're looking at psilocybin for treating nicotine addiction uh, for use with um, people addicted to tobacco. And I thought about this and I thought this is fascinating. So we have a substance like tobacco, which is legal and kills hundreds of thousands of people every year. Uh, and we're using psilocybin, which is highly illegal. Um, you know, you can get a lifetime imprisonment for producing it. And it kills zero people every year. Uh, it's quite strange, isn't it, when you think about it? Um, and other treatments, and iboga as well, and ayahuasca. Iboga has been found to be very useful in the treatment of heroin, and uh, Rita's actually been doing some research into the use of ayahuasca for drug addictions as well. Uh, these are some of the projects going on in the UK. So pretty much since kind of 2009 in Bristol, the last six years, we've seen a kind of a mushrooming of research happening, and there's projects uh, <laughs> popping up literally uh, various uh, institutions. I'm working with colleagues at Oxford and Imperial on various projects. Um, so there's lots of, it really is a lot of research just starting. So in terms of how does it actually work? Well, typically, you know, during a psychedelic session, this is kind of what happens to you on psychedelics in a kind of graphic form. At the beginning, you know, this is the intensity of your experience. And you have the, the the psychedelic state and the afterglow, and then finally the effects wear off, usually. Um, and then uh, you also, but occasionally people will have a peak or mystical-like experience, and we find that people who do have these peak or mystical experiences, they respond better to the treatment. Um, these are the ones that kind of tend to have more profound, long-lasting, beneficial effects. Um, uh, it's a bit hard to describe what is a mystical experience, really, though. Uh, I didn't know that was good. Scientists, uh, so I mean, what is the mystical experience? Um, <laughs> there was some really good research done in, in Harvard in the, in the 1960s by uh, Walter Panke. Uh, he was working with Leary and the, the Harvard team there. Fascinating character, Panke. A medical doctor, theologian, PhD, psychiatric residency, all at Harvard. By the age of 30, he was kind of, you know, an overachiever, um, but then died shortly afterwards in a diving accident. Um, but before he did, he did this very important bit of research called the, the Good Friday experiment, and it gives us a little bit of insight in, into what we mean by the mystical experience. Um, so the argument was, well, you know, you can take a psychedelic and have this spiritual or mystical experience, but is it real, is it genuine? So he took 20 Christian theologians and uh, randomly assigned 10 of them to experimental group, 10 to a control condition. He gave 10 of them psilocybin, 10 of them uh, a placebo, and he put them all in a chapel together and they listened to the Good Friday Mass. And then they measured their kind of, their mystical experience, if you like, afterwards. And sure enough, those in the psilocybin condition had, as they could measure it, a, a kind of mystical experience. Uh, so these are the kind of measures they were looking at. Unity, uh, a sense of transcendence of time and space, a deeply felt positive mood, a sense of sacredness, uh, the sense that the experience had objectivity and reality, that it was paradoxical, you can't quite understand it, not only that, you can't quite explain it either because it's what we call ineffable. Uh, you can't really express it in words. But it's also transient and, importantly, in the long term, that has lasting positive changes in the person's attitudes and behaviours. So people are changed by these experiences for the better. And sure enough, they found that, yeah, those who took the psilocybin uh, tended to tick those kinds of boxes. Uh, there was a follow-up study as well by Rick Doblin, 25 years later. They managed to track down uh, 19 of the original participants, 16 of which uh, were interviewed um, 
three of them didn't want to be, and they found that uh, 25 years later, all of those who had been in the experimental group uh, said that they'd had a genuine mystical experience, and in fact, they were still working as theologians, um, whereas only half of those in the control group were, which may also say something. Um, and since then, these studies have been replicated at John Hopkins University um, using psilocybin as well. I'm going to all the details. Um, but in that study, they found, not using Christian theologians, but people with a spiritual practice of any kind, and they found that 61% reported a complete mystical experience after psilocybin, and 67% uh, of them said it was the single most, uh, or in the top five, most meaningful experiences in their life, uh, even like perhaps compared to the birth of their first child or getting married or something like that. So these are kind of massively significant experiences. And they found that also in the long term, there was kind of positive changes in the behavior and attitude, not just by self-report, but when they asked their colleagues and their family, well, are they actually a better person? And they would say, well, yes. Um, so it's good. Um, I'm going to the details of that. I think I'm, am I going backwards? So these substances have the potential to induce long-lasting, positive, beneficial experiences through the mystical experience itself. Um, set and setting is important. Difficult experiences may arise, but can be worked through. And what we find, so in a, in a clinical setting, you can have some degree of control about how many people have those experiences. Uh, but according to Wolf, approximately 25% of people will have a mystical experience anyway, just using psychedelics in any kind of context in a recreational setting. And this has implications for therapy, psychotherapy. Um, I can't really give a talk on, on psychedelics here in, in Czech without mentioning Stanislav Grof, and I think he did a lot of excellent work really in mapping the terrain of the transpersonal experience of this mystical experience, um, which you know is somewhat controversial, but he really has done a lot of work in that regard. And I think there's a very good roadmap for understanding the psychedelic experience. Uh, as we know, he did uh, over 4,000 psychedelic therapy sessions and as an occupational hazard, being a psychedelic psychotherapist, you see that people have lots of weird experiences. Now this is going into some fairly controversial territory, but he would say that people would have past life experiences, out of body experiences, uh, ESP, getting information from the future, uh, remote viewing and space time travel on a daily basis. This is kind of what happens every day as a psychedelic psychotherapist. So how do we kind of understand those experiences? They may not necessarily be real, but people are having these really extraordinary experiences. Um, and Groff tried to kind of map those by categorizing them into different types. And you can look more into that. That's kind of one of my uh, areas of interest and, and research as well. But um, maybe you can talk more about that in the Q&A. Um, so how do we kind of come to understand these extraordinary experiences where people say, well, I've transcended space and time? And a, perhaps a good way to consider it is uh, in the context of, sh of shamanism. Um, so although in the West we've known about these psychedelics and been researching them for 100 years, uh, shamans in different traditions have been using these substances for thousands of years. They've known about them for a very long time. The Huichol uh, here from Mexico uh, been using psychoactive peyote cactus. Uh, archaeological evidence suggests they've been using it for at least five and a half thousand years in that region of the world, so probably much longer. And we find that in every part of the world, in every continent of the planet, we have uh, shamans who have been using these things traditionally. A shaman is a person who goes into an altered state of consciousness at will, in the name of their community to, uh, to heal, uh, to gain information from beyond space and time, and to communicate with the spirits of nature. That's their job description. 
I mean, whether or not you believe it's real or not, it doesn't matter. That's, that's what their, their job is. Um, so these are the Weichel shamans who use um, peyote. I've been working with these. Uh, also in Mexico, we have the use of uh, uh, psilocybin mushrooms. We, we first discovered the use of psilocybin mushrooms in Mexico with the Mazatec Indians. Uh, we find the use of different kinds of mushrooms in, in Northern Europe. The tradition has been the use of this red and white spotted fly agaric mushroom, which has gone to this woman's fashion sense as well. Uh, she started dressing up like it. Uh, we have the use of uh, datura in India, uh, perhaps, it's probably cannabis, but uh, the use of paturi in Australia, uh, the use of iboga in Africa, the use of uh, Syrian rue perhaps in uh, the Middle East and North Africa, and of course uh, in the Amazon we have the use of ayahuasca and other substances. So all over the world we see shamans traditionally using these psychedelic plants and they use them to transcend space and time. Um, some of my interest in research has been with ayahuasca. They, uh, the, the kind of experiences people report are, you know, kind of communicating with uh, other beings, like maybe jaguars or spirits of the forest. Uh, often people see lots of serpents and snakes in ayahuasca experiences. Um, and uh, I don't know where I'm going next. The, <laughs> how do we come to understand these extraordinary experiences then? Um, how is it they can be used to heal? So in the shamanic context, uh, people you know, use these, they have some kind of spontaneous healing perhaps. Uh, there needs to be more research done on this, but how does it actually occur? One theory is that, well, people are getting better through some kind of suggestion or placebo effect. You go and see the shaman, uh, they tell you you're going to get better, you have an intense psychedelic experience, you have an increase in suggestibility, and uh, you spontaneously recover through some kind of, and this is not well understood, um, top-down, you know, um, self-suggestion, if you like. Um, but when you talk to people about the kind of experiences they have, often people will say they have direct revelation. They have a kind of direct insight into their own condition. They may understand what's been making them ill. Uh, it may be that they understand that the physical symptoms they have of illness have come from a, a psychological cause, perhaps some childhood trauma. I met a woman this week, actually. She, had, uh, she was a professional runner. Uh, for, she ran for a country, and uh, she had damage to her ankle, and she wasn't able to run anymore. And she was going to have an operation. They, they suggested an operation for it. She looked on the internet and found that reports of other people had had the same operation and it had gone very badly wrong and they could no longer walk, let alone run. And so she decided not to have the operation. She looked for alternative treatment and she ended up in the Amazon and drank ayahuasca and got better. Just like that. Um, so how is it, you know, you drink a highly psychedelic substance you have an intense psychological experience and you heal a very physical problem. I mean, this is quite curious. Um, but for her, it was through insight into the psychological causes of her physical condition. Um, some of the weirder stuff that people talk about, so shamans talk about seeing inside people's bodies, uh, maybe seeing organs, maybe seeing uh, cells, maybe even seeing DNA. I mean, how is this possible? Um, certainly not with the eyes as we know it. But there was some, uh, an interesting book by an anthropologist called Jeremy Narby. He went to the Amazon. He was very much steeped in the, the Western medical scientific tradition. Um, and he was working with this uh, indigenous group who use ayahuasca. And they were talking about all their kind of mythology and their magical beliefs. And he felt a little bit sorry for them. He says, well, they're nice people, but, you know, they're a little bit deluded. Um, then he drank ayahuasca. Um, <laughs> that all changed. That all changed. I mean, he changed his world view. And he, he thought, well, these people are actually, they're actually right, you know. <laughs> um, so he wrote this interesting book, and he had this thesis that shamans see these uh, serpents so much on ayahuasca uh, often they're like a, 
intertwined like a double helix. And he suggested, well, this is uh, symbolic of their seeing DNA uh, whilst they're in this uh, psychedelic state. It's a, quite an extravagant theory. Um, but it is it so weird? Uh, this man here, Carrie Mullis, he won the uh, Nobel Prize for biochemistry some years ago. He's being presented with the prize by the King of Sweden. And uh, he got that for inventing something called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Really important in genetic research because it allows you to replicate a single strand of DNA. Um, so it was fundamental for the Human Genome Project for forensic genetics and all kinds of DNA um, molecular biology research. So he got the Nobel Prize and afterwards, obviously, he said, well, I, I was able to make this discovery from taking LSD. And, he says, and I would fly alongside the strands of the DNA. He would kind of just actually see it, it'd be there traveling along. <laughs> and he, was, he said he was able to look at the DNA on a molecular level and experience it. Uh, and that gave him his breakthrough in his research. Um, it's also said that Francis Crick, now this is probably not true, but it, I mean it could be true, but we don't know. Francis Crick was, uh, it said that after his death, there was a, a news article came out that said uh, he was on LSD when he discovered the double helix shape of the DNA. Um, now, we don't know if that's true because he's not allow, alive to, to support that, but uh, we do know that he did take a lot of LSD, uh, but probably not in 1953. Maybe, it's possible. So Jeremy Narby, although he was, had a, changed his worldview, he was still a scientifically trained, and so he wanted to test this kind of rather wild idea, and he took three molecular biologists out to the Amazon jungle, uh, they'd never been to the Amazon, they'd never heard of ayahuasca, and uh, all of them had a problem in their research, okay, so they were trying to make a breakthrough. They drank ayahuasca, and of course, they all had a breakthrough in their research. They were have, able to have some insights, um, and one of them, a woman, reported flying alongside the strands of DNA uh, and was able to see it at a molecular level. Now, is that, I mean, are they people really seeing DNA? I mean, is that actually possible? Well, that's a whole other question, but it could be that it enhanced their sense of imagination to the point um, where they could visualize what it was like. Um, either way, it's shown to be useful. So how does that kind of map then to what shamans say about their experiences and how they help people to, to get well, to heal? Um, and what does it say about the mod med medical model? Uh, I mean, we've got a bit of a, a, a disjuncture here between the Western medical worldview and how we perhaps may be able to use psychedelics as treatments. You know, the, the view is in the West, you go to the doctor, um, you know, they do some tests on you and they tell you, okay, now take this drug. Now, if you go to a shaman in the Amazon, they kind of look at you and they take the drug, and then they tell you what's wrong with you. Okay, so. so it's just, you know, we've got a very kind of conflict of how these substances are used in treatment. Uh, but I think there is a middle ground, you know, it's certainly in times of psychedelic psychotherapy. Um, I'll kind of finish off with a couple of other insights as well in that. There's a, uh, if you look at a typical book on neuroscience or uh, psychology or neurobiology from maybe five years or ten years ago, uh, it was thought that in adulthood you never develop new brain cells. But what we do know now is what's called neurogenesis and that uh, you do, in certain parts of the brain, there is the regeneration of new brain cells, particularly in the hippocampus. Um, and what we're also discovering is that there's certain key indicators of neurogenesis, such as the presence of BNDF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, and we find that psychedelics are related to an increase in the presence of BNDF. So psychedelic substances, such as iboga, psilocybin, ketamine, and cannabis, seem to be related to the, the production of new brain cells. 
um, which also has massive implications. Uh, I was thinking about this, is maybe also psychedelics can probably help people to get more well through maybe ecogenesis as well. The fact that the generation of, of nature, you know, uh, re-engaging with nature. Uh, one of the things that people report on psychedelics is, is a greater sense of connection with the outside world, with plants, with animals. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up now. And, um, you know, s things like schizophrenia are urban diseases, okay? People have higher rates of schizophrenia in cities, uh, we find, you know, and in more developed countries, okay? So there's something about living together in very confined spaces uh, that predicts certain kinds of mental illness. And a reconnection with nature is, can be probably quite useful as a treatment in, in itself. Um, finally, there's an, the, another relationship here into how we get well is through creativity because, uh, you know, mental illness can probably be alleviated through the creative act, through being creative, and, and creativity, vice versa, is uh, the absence of creativity is the kind of, is the presence of mental illness. Um, and a very good example, I think, of, of somebody who used psychedelics for creativity is Steve Jobs. Uh, and uh, he was famously said, you know, he invented a few interesting things, started this kind of well-known company, and he said that, Doing LSD was one of the two or three most important things I've done in my life, okay? Uh, I don't know what the other one was, you know, uh, but that's quite a, quite a statement. And it, so doing LSD for Steve Jobs really did change him. Um, so I think creativity is also important as a means of, of uh, getting towards mental health. And I'm gonna really just whisk through that. There's only one study being done a controlled experiment which was done in the 1960s and they took a number of professionals in various fields and they gave them LSD for the first time and they got them to work on various problems in their professional work and they found that many of them were able to have either some kind of breakthrough with a product, a patent or a publication and some of the things that came out of that experiment with only about 20 participants was the, the mathematical theorem for Norgate circuits Somebody came up with a new conceptual model of a photon, uh, a linear electron accelerator beam steering device. Uh, we've all got one of those, haven't we? Um, so there was a lot of kind of great um, practical uh, product, products came out of that experiment. And finally, we find that uh, creativity is also related to the personality dimension of openness. And we find that People have had a mystical experience on psilocybin in recent research uh, also uh, have an increase long term, even one year later, in the domain of openness uh, as a personality dimension. Run out of time, so I'm going to stop it there. Thank you. Thank you, David, and thank you for coming. Uh, now there will be uh, some time, not much, but uh, some time for the, your questions. So if you would like to ask something, just uh, raise your hand, and uh, someone from our team will bring you the microphone. Uh, you said that there were, was no evidence for um, the overdoses of, of LSD or the lethal doses. Mm -hmm. Do we know um, approximately how much it would be to kill someone? Uh, a lot, probably. I mean, with LSD, I mean, if you can take 10,000 doses and, and not die, uh, then, I mean, uh, I imagine at a certain dosage, it's, it's not having any effect any, on you anyway. But uh, I don't know at what point it becomes physiologically toxic. Um, I mean, everything is a toxin, really. Paracelsus told us that. Um, and in certain dosages, they can be beneficial. And uh, the difference between a toxin and a poison and a, a medicine is dosage, really. Uh, even water can kill you. You know, if you drink too much water, you can die. So 
there is always going to be, you know, you, but you may have to eat a lot. And given that it's quite hard to get hold of that much LSD, it's going to be very unlikely. Hello. Hi. As a man with your experience from the research, uh, can you imagine a world, a world in which LSD would be legal? I mean, in which we could like legally buy it in a store? And if you can imagine the world, uh, do you think that this world could function? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the legality is an interesting thing because, okay, so they made it criminal in the... 60s and 70s, um, LSD and other psychedelics, and it, it didn't really effectively stop people taking it. In fact, people carried on to take it, and increasingly, you know, uh, it stopped research and it stopped the, the kind of therapeutic use of it. So uh, I don't know whether the legality is, is such a, a a big problem, really, in that sense. But I do see a time where when they would be. Um, legal and are used as, as uh, treatments, yeah. There's various projects going on right now. Um, uh, one of the projects in the UK is looking at, at a treatment for dementia. Uh, and it may be a time in which, I mean, if that proves useful, I mean, there's nothing worse that people fear more um, than dementia. You know, even taking psychedelics is, is not as kind of scary as, as going senile. So if that proves to be beneficial, then I think, you know, we could see a change. Um, so, yeah, maybe one day Granny and Grandad will have their little LSD, LSD blister packs and uh, meanwhile all the kids will be experimenting with these, uh, you know, several thousand new research chemicals uh, and that'll just be what, what the old folks do, you know, who knows? Who knows? Okay, um, I would like to ask you, let's stay with the legality issue. You said it's illegal both in England and in Czech Republic. So how do you do it exactly? Okay, so research is still uh, allowed. Um, there was a thing, okay, so when the, I mean, in the States, when it became criminalized, uh, it effectively stopped uh, psychedelic research with humans. Now, it wasn't, it was nowhere ever written that you couldn't do research with psychedelics with humans, okay? It just, it just became career suicide and it became a massive taboo. Uh, so it is possible, you know, you have to get a government license, for instance, in the UK, but it's still possible to give people psychedelics. Um, it was just always seen as being very difficult to do, and nobody wanted to, to go down that route in the last 30 or 40 years, but now it's more possible. Yep. Well, there is a psychedelic research going on in our institute, and uh, psilocybin is administered to healthy volunteers currently. It's just quite difficult to get the um, you know approval for this study, ethical approval, and then approval of the SUCL uh, state um, office for the control of substances. But it's possible, yeah. Can I volunteer? Well, you should contact people from from our institute, not not directly me. But you can find it on our website. Tomáš Palenček is the guy who runs this research. Um, I would like to ask you how important how important do you think uh, the uh, let's say the shamanic um, ritual it's important in ayahuasca experience or how how big let's say is the effect of it? Yeah, I think. Um Again, it's set and setting, you know, and it's, it's really useful. Obviously, there's a, a, a cosmology attached to ayahuasca, which is unique to, you know, South America, um, which may not always translate for us yeah, as Westerners. Um, but the, the actual set and setting and the ritual is, is very useful. Um, and t it's quite simple, really. It's usually, it's kind of done with some preparation. There's intention. Uh, it's kind of done in a kind of contained space and with music and there's integration integration afterwards which isn't really much different from what we see in psychedelic psychotherapy um but you know you may get tobacco smoke blown over you and you know agua florida spat in your face and that kind of thing so there's kind of a slight differences but the basic structure is is the same as in uh psychedelic psychotherapy really and that's to enable the set and setting 
Thank you. <laughs> but I just uh, want to know if you see some difference, let's say, in the experience with the ritual and without. If this increase uh, the the whole experience or otherwise. Uh, I don't know of any kind of research that's been done to look at that. Um, I mean, you can talk to people about it. Typically, people use the ritual context for ayahuasca, but there are, you know, there's research programs going on, particularly in Spain, where they they're using capsules and measured doses of ayahuasca and giving it to people in a in a less kind of shamanic context. Um, but it, there hasn't been any comparison studies, as far as I know. So I don't have I don't have data, but I imagine the experience will be different. I mean, taking psilocybin and having it injected into you and then going in a brain scanner is, is a somewhat different experience to maybe, you know, taking it in a shamanic context. Um, you may have a similar experience. It will just seem incongruous to have that, you know, it will seem out of context to have that experience in a brain scanner. That's, I mean, so that may make it a little bit more tricky. That's all. I hope that answers it. Question. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, <laughs> I was hands. wondering. Hi. Hi. Here. Hi. I was wondering if there are any cases where you discourage the use of psychedelics, any kind of psychological predispositions or anything like that. Uh, I I discourage the use of any illegal activity. Um, <laughs> but in terms of like who. Or what context or what people probably should and shouldn't take it. I don't know. I mean, I think if you have a propensity for psychotic episodes, I would be very careful. You know, I'd really consider perhaps not taking psychedelics or if you're actually very sensitive to them, you know, uh, some people take them and, and they, they can stay high for quite a, a long time. Uh, not often, but there are some people, I think, who are, are, are more prone to that. Um, saying that, you know, in the 60s, they were using psychedelics to treat psychotic uh, disorders, you know, um, and with some success. But I think you've got your work cut out for you, you know. Uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily encourage people who have a psychosis proneness, you know, to take psychedelics or to do it with, with a lot of caution, certainly. Thank you. Okay. I wanted to ask, what do you think about the statement that uh, psychedelics are loosening the borderline between the consciousness and the subconscious? Yeah, I think, that's, I think it's a useful phrase. I mean, we don't, it's hard to define, well, we don't have a definition of consciousness, let alone subconsciousness in a way, really. Not good, but I think we all understand what those terms mean, more or less, and I think, I think that's really useful because you do get a lot of unconscious material coming up uh, we can see that by maybe accessing repressed memories you know or things you'd long since forgotten about or very early childhood memories um, so and I think that there needs to be more research on this definitely there hasn't been very much research done to look at that um, but certainly people report those experiences so I think that can be useful you know in the therapeutic context um, but it seems like it, yeah. From a personal level, I would say, yeah, I could, I could, I can go for that, yeah. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, due to the such state of legality of mm -hmm. such substances, uh, I'm wondering about what you learned so far that we can, how we can reap benefits at least partly of using such substances without using them. How do you, how do you, can you say that again? Well, you can't say, you, you, you can't buy it, you can't sell uh -huh. it, you can make it, you can't carry it. Uh -huh. So, and due to the thing that you do, that you perceive the changes and you analyze it, then probably you might have learned something that can be done without using them and still reap some benefits. Okay, so how do we get the benefits from not taking psychedelics? How do we get the benefits from psychedelics by not taking them? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. okay. It's uh, a really good question, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I mean, it, you cannot take them when you're out walking in the mountains and 
in autumn and they're growing everywhere. Uh, you know, there's various times in which you cannot take them. Um, for instance, but you could take them in, in research, perhaps. You could take them as a participant in, in a study or as a scientist uh, or in various other countries. Um, I mean, and what, what classifies as a psychedelic, even breathing can be kind of quite a psychedelic experience, you know, if you take part in some kind of breath work or uh, over breathing, you know. Uh, so there's lots of ways you can access psychedelic states without psychedelics as well. Um, and there's other techniques for getting into altered states of consciousness. I mean, we're, luckily we get a free one every night and that's dreaming, you know, that's a dream is a psychedelic state of its own variety. But what we can learn from those experiences then is that, well, we have to constantly learn from them, I think. And if, if, you, if we're not integrating the experiences and um, developing from them, you know, then we're doing something wrong, I think. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Soda, thank you. Would you like to answer your own question? Ah, no way. <laughs> no, no, no way. Uh, my question is, if you have any suggestions for people who would like to participate in the research, but not as volunteers, but as con conductors or some t somehow helping with the research mm -hmm. uh, to people who are not uh, medical professionals or psychologists? Yeah, I think um, join a psychedelic society, um, get to know the researchers in the area, um, maybe become a researcher. Uh, I was lucky enough to recruit several of my psychology students to take part as researchers, you know, ad administering uh, tests in, in LSD sessions. So, you know, there's, there's only so many people can get involved at, at once. But, yeah, there's, I'd say just get involved in, in what's happening and in, with the research and maybe consider training or going down that avenue. You don't have to be a medical doctor. I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a psychologist. Um, but it, this area of research attracts people from all different fields. So, And then if that doesn't work, there's always anthropology. Um, you can go and visit a culture uh, somewhere else where they do do this kind of thing. So. Uh, recently I read an article about uh about uh, ayahuasca using for uh, uh, medical, maybe psychological purposes, and uh, uh, I read there that as much as 20% of users uh, didn't uh, didn't adapt to to real world and to real uh, just real situations. Uh, they didn't want to to return back to to ordinary world. Uh, or to, to their homes or, or some kind of... Do you think it's real, that number? Do you think it's, um, it's a danger? Thank you. Uh, I don't know. I haven't seen that, that research. I, I think certainly there will be some people who have ayahuasca experience or maybe, you know, in, in a foreign country and it, it may be life-changing to the point where they don't want to go back to their job and all the rest of it. I mean, that might not necessarily be a bad thing if they're doing the wrong job, you know. Uh, that might be kind of useful for them. Uh, um, but I'm not necessarily saying it's necessarily bad, you know. But I think there is a sense in which some people may find that they just want to be doing ayahuasca, you know, they just kind of because that, that experience is so mind-blowing to them. Um, there are churches in Brazil, for instance, you know, Christian churches, and they take ayahuasca quite a lot. Uh, it's, it's kind of part of what they do. And if you become a member of that church, you may drink ayahuasca several times a week. But they, uh, they also kind of function and have jobs. Uh, so but, so there, it's, it's possible to live a kind of lifestyle where you do drink a lot of ayahuasca. Um, I see a friend of mine who was a, a, an academic and somebody asked him at a conference, but ayahuasca is a drug, isn't it addictive? And he said, uh, no, it's not addictive actually, and I would know, I've taken it thousands of times. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, hello. Uh, taking into account uh, current level of scientific knowledge, uh, what is what do you consider to be the substance with the biggest potential for healing and for healing of what? So, the healing of what? Well, healing, yeah, a substance, and oh. for healing of what? Like what substance and how to use the substance? Yeah, um, I think that I think they all have their own benefits in different ways. I mean, for instance, iboga, I think, is, is, has a lot of potential for treating heroin addiction, okay, particularly. But it also is somewhat risky. Um, I think DMT is, is fascinating in that it's actually occurring in our own body. So I think, you know, the potential for that and understanding in science is, is massive. Uh, what is DMT for and why is it in our body? Um, uh, but as it, I think... I think they all have different, different benefits. I wouldn't say any one substance is, is the substance for any one ailment. And essentially, they're all kind of keys, I think, to uh, a kind of access to some other dimension of our personality. Um, and that's the real benefit. So, and it may not be that psychedelics are for everybody or every psychedelic is, is, is for you, you know, that you may find that it's different for different people. We don't really know enough, I would say. Just we need more research, really.